Yeah, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Transparency International says about $5 billion stolen from Nigeria is frozen in accounts in foreign countries. Uh, this was made known in Abuja during a media workshop organized by the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, SISLAC. SISLAC is the local chapter of Transparency International in Nigeria. SESLAC and Transparency International also estimate that the amount lost annually in Nigeria is between 18 to 25 billion dollars. SESLAC's program officer for anti-corruption, Samuel Asimi, is joining us via Zoom. Good morning, uh, Samuel Asimi, and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Very shocking statistics there that Transparency International has put out as to the billions of dollars that are leaving Nigeria every, every year. I mean, with how far we've come, you would assume that you know, the government, with all its anti-corruption promises, would be doing enough to check this. Why do we still have a recurrence? And the fact that the amount of illicit financial flows from Nigeria is so bad that you know Transparency International estimates that Nigeria is one of the most you know you know the countries with one of the most record of illicit financial flows. Uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, I, and I hope you can hear me clearly because the network is a bit um, having some glitch. Yes, we can hear uh, As per the report you're talking about, I mean over time Nigeria has actually suffered lots of illicit financial outflows in terms of money laundering and the rest. Um, the Tabuki Mbeki panel, Tabu Mbeki panel puts that at about um, uh, $18 billion annually, estimated, leaves Nigeria annually. And this has happened over time, since over decades and the rest. Now, going to the statistics we are talking about, this was actually gotten from the World Bank slash UNODC Stolen Asset Recovery Database, STAR initiative, where they actually looked around assets uh, that are in tax havens and others that they are trying to repatriate. So amongst these, they listed, of course, lots of uh, uh, volumes of assets. And if you total them, it's estimated to be about um, $5 billion. Now, this is an issue because uh, corruption ar around procurement, public procurement, uh, we have um, diversion of funds, we have embe embezzlement of funds by different individuals. Over time, led to what we are having now, where funds have been stashed across foreign jurisdictions in a uh, way of um, maybe shell banks, uh, shell corporations and the rest. Also institutions without beneficial ownership register and institutions that encourage um, uh, people to save money without doing enhanced due diligence and maybe having basic EML, KYC, you know your customer principles. All these uh, entities and all these um, havens, tax havens and uh, uh, jurisdictions have actually led to what we have now and it's 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 really terrible because these amounts touched abroad are actually huge funds that if brought back into the country would actually help in moving the country forward and this is why uh, we keep on saying and we keep on pressing that, that it is important for us to have these funds repatriated back into the country because the commonwealth of citizens and nigerians have been stolen over time in the past and it's time for us to bring them back of course this didn't just happen uh, once this happened over a period of time, we had different leaders. I mean, you all see about the Abacha loot at some point. Mm. And we also have the Bori loot which we've just gotten. So all these over time actually led to this situation where we have an estimated of about $5 billion out of the country. Um, we, of course, uh, like Aneta mentioned, Nigeria is uh, the country rated the highest in Africa, uh, in Africa uh, with regards to illicit financial flows. Um, what do you, or would you say makes it so easy for funds to continue to just leave the country? Don't we have enough, you know, um, anti-corruption uh, legislation in, or laws in place? Don't we have enough bank laws in place that, you know, might stop these flows from, from you know, continuing to happen? Well, um, over time in the past, we've enacted some laws. I mean, we have uh, laws that have been enacted a while. We have the Public Procurement um, Act at some point. We have other um, pieces of legal frameworks to actually prevent these uh, outflows. Now, uh, I, I think the key thing is 
while we have these laws in place, we also have a challenge enforcing them. So it's one thing to have those laws in place. It's another thing to have them being enforced to the latter. And if you look over time, uh, individuals have been able to divert resources, divert funds, uh, embezzle money, take all this abroad. We also have a weak um, uh, judiciary, I would say weak legal system in terms of uh, the judiciary the courts convicting all those cases. Um, like you could see with the Bori case, at some point he was actually, uh, a court actually acquitted him of these charges and he went out there, he was now still found guilty of these charges related to the offenses he committed. So these are the kind of challenges we face. The system is weak to get these individuals and perpetrators. And the challenge is once this uh, politically exposed person escaped through the system, then we have lots of funds out there. So. Well, Yes, we have some considerable amount of legal frameworks, but enforcing them has been a challenge. And this is where we all think, and we as Transparency International think, we need to tighten the loopholes and ensure that funds don't leave the country, especially in this time where we are looking at um, economic, where the economic indices and numbers are not really favorable. But th this is what I'm trying to find out. How easy will it be to move $500 million or a billion dollars out of Nigeria? without any um, you know, uh, laws blocking such um, flow, of such uh, transfers of funds. Um, how easy you know, is it? And of course, remember that Nigeria has signed some agreements with the US and I guess with other countries uh, for repatriation of funds that have been stashed in, in those countries. And so you know, do those countries also play a role in accepting these funds from, um, from Nigerians? Um, has that also made it difficult? for us to block some of these funds transferred to different countries across the world? Absolutely. Um, I'll start with the first point, talking around um, how this left. So it didn't just happen once. I think I should actually point that out. So this happened in piecemeal. So we have different individuals, different politically exposed persons take these funds out of the country via different forms, via shell corporations, via, of course, you know, they would have companies that are just fictitious in areas and islands, you know, like the Panama Leaks, all these Paradise yes. Papers, Paradise Leaks, and all tax havens across the country where uh, there is still enhanced customer due diligence. Now, definitely, we have challenge around um, uh, tax havens, jurisdictions that just allow people to just bring funds in without asking the questions they are supposed to ask. You know, uh, there's this saying that says, um, if you don't have a pocket to keep something, then you won't steal it. So if these havens don't encourage individuals to actually keep those funds where there, if they have financial institutions like banks that ask questions, banks that do enhance customer due diligence, you bring the money, just check with the country, they check where you are, they ask what kind of business are you doing? Is this commensurate with the funds you're bringing to stash here in our banks? If we have um, entities that carry this out, and I, I think that would really help. Um, just late last year, the U.S. passed their AMLA, that's the U.S. Anti-Money Laundering Act, which was part of the Defense uh, uh, Act, which uh, Defense Bill, which the U.S. Um, also have. I think that was uh, a very, very good step, and it, leads, it also speaks to the question you have. Uh, those laws in place, it also tried to... Uh, prohibits uh, uh, shell companies around the U.S. And I think that's very fantastic because that legislations like that really help us to we help prevent individuals taking funds from there. And as you know, at some point last year, we got some repatriation from uh, uh, the U.S. and the state of Jersey. And most recently, we also have some funds. Uh, I think if we are able to prevent these funds from going there, if these uh, jurisdictions, if these entities, if these governments really, really ensure that their banking system is sanitized and it's not a place where uh, individuals from developing countries can just bring funds to and take them there. That would also go a long way to prevent uh, illicit financial flow and money laundering where we have funds in huge amounts being taken to these countries. Mm. Mr. Asimi, now when these monies eventually are repatriated to Nigeria, there's also the issue of the lack of transparency and management in how these funds are utilized. You know, so this seems to now make way for relooting of looted funds. How much of a challenge is this in Nigeria? I, 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 I would like to stress that this is indeed a challenge in Nigeria. Um, to be fair, the current administration has made good progress in repatriating assets, 
we have to give it to them. If we, we've had a bachelor loops, 321 million at some point. We've had uh, the one from the United States and Jersey. We've had the Ugoi loops now. The government has actually been repatriating assets internationally and domestically. I think it's important for us to also bring the domestic angle and the domestic repatriations into context as well. Because if you drive around Abuja, you see building keep off, EFCC, you see we hear of seizures, we hear of gold, we hear of jewelries, we hear of private jets, we hear of plazas, we hear of shopping complex. These are also repatriated assets as a, because domestically anyway, not internationally. So these are assets that are recovered domestically. And this is also an area it will be which we at Sislak also feel citizens should pay attention to. Um, to mark Democracy Day last year, uh, it was around June, June 12th last year, we had uh, the former acting chairman of EFCC, Mr. Ibrahim Magu. He gave the figure at about 980 billion naira has been recovered. About that figure was recovered in the last five years. Now, that's, you could say that's about a trillion naira that has been recovered. So that, that gives you a kind of context into the amount of domestic recoveries we also have. Now, the challenge. The challenge here is the government is doing well in recovering assets. We have a challenge in managing and utilizing these assets. The Economics and Financial Crimes Commission recovers assets. The ICPC, Independent Court Practices, Other Related Offenses Commission, they recover assets. Code of Conduct Bureau recovers assets. The customs, I mean, cars, rice, disease from the borders and the rest, they recover assets. You talk of the NDLA, they recover assets. You talk of the police. So these are entities and agencies with mandates, anti-corruption agencies and law enforcement agencies with mandates to recover assets legally, and they are approved by law. Now, the challenge is, they actually do these recoveries separately. They do these recoveries individually as agencies. We don't have a coordination, a coordination mechanism, a central database, a central system where you and I can say how much has been recovered from Nigeria so far. Is there any way we can check up, we can check this out? That's a challenge. Two, we also need a, a you'd say like a register. Say maybe you're walking around, you somewhere around Maitama, Asoko, we say, and you see a building being uh, labeled keep off EFCC, and you say, okay, this is the building, this is the location, what's happening to the building? You could maybe have like a database where you could just search, you say, okay, this building, it has been forfeited, or it's under interim forfeiture. Now, when I say interim forfeiture, you know, some of these uh, uh, items, they could be matters be before the courts. And while they're in the courts, they're at interim forfeiture level because it's not final forfeiture, because the courts could decide that no, this is wrong, it needs to go back to the owner, or the court would say, yes, you are right, this needs to be forfeited to the government. So this uh, uh, database or this portal or whatever we we'll call it, or register, should actually have all this together. So not separately, we shouldn't have individual agencies doing this separately. We should have the collective database where citizens can come and see all the assets as they've been rec recovered and see how they are being used, and definitely we could say good the government is accountable and we could see what these funds are being used to otherwise you have a scenario where citizens don't really know what has happened to the funds and you see citizens saying no this is wrong uh, our funds are not being used for us and the rest yeah so that's the and transparency I give you an example. that we're so talking much. about I, I see me I see me I said that's the transparency yes, that, that we're talking about like the fact that the government needs to you know let the people know what's happening well let's get your two cents on that Ibori loot that you know you've mentioned several times uh, this morning there's there was a big debate about who truly owns the fund if it's the federal government or the people of Delta State uh, from your stance what do you think it should be okay um Nigeria is signatory to um, different, uh, uh, I would say, agreements, commitments internationally. In 2016, we had the London uh, Anti-Corruption Commitment, the UNCAC. And in 2017, we also signed the Global Forum on Access Recovery. That's the GFA principles. And one of the principles, I think principle five of the GFA, actually states that um, recovered assets should be repatriated back to the people with these assets were stolen from. And that's what we all signed up to as a nation. So if you're going by that, then it should go back to the people the funds were stolen from, which of course is still trusted. Now, looking at it generally, you could see the challenge we have uh, as a nation now is we are using um, different templates to solve each uh, repatriation. And that's why we at CISLA call for, say, a framework like a legislation. We've talked about the process of crime acts. It, we couldn't get it scaled through. We talk about the, now we have POKMA, Process of Crimes Management Agency Act, 
um, bill, rather. This is also before parliament. This is what we are trying to push. What this does is, if we have uh, the process of uh, crime act or process of crime management uh, bill, just in legal... All right. Uh, we seem to be uh, losing uh, Samuel Asimi yeah. there. Uh, of course, uh, still speaking about uh, the $5 billion of uh, stolen and frozen um, funds uh, in um, all the countries and uh, the state that Nigeria currently is with regards to repatriating these funds and how we currently are the you know, country in Africa with the highest amount of illicit financial flows uh, outside Nigeria. Uh, I would definitely like him to speak a little bit more on the... Um, uh, proceeds of uh, Crime Act and how yes. that would change because apparently the president, I believe, had signed it in 2015. So uh, how much of that has been implemented and how much has that changed anything, you know? And um, we do have laws in Nigeria that limit the amount of money that you can receive here in the country. I think once it goes beyond $5,000 for an individual and $10,000 for, you know, a company, uh, there's red flags here and there. But why don't we have the same thing with moving funds outside Nigeria and uh, yes. these big companies that uh, mm -hmm. set up here and there to receive funds that, you know, never use. And I like one thing that Simi mentioned. You know, we've been talking about illicit financial flows, m funds going from Nigeria to other parts of the world. But he mentioned funds here that are, you know, stolen in Nigeria and remain in Nigeria, talking about the domestic aspect of this. To bring this even closer to home, you see cases where people in customs, they seize goods for whatever reason, and they, in turn, begin to sell it. That's the looting of related funds we're talking about. But right. good to know we have Samuel Asimi here. Welcome um, back, Mr. Asimi. Okay, oh, I think still that, trying to fix that yeah. network issue. So, so really, the, the problems of this country, as, as much as they seem to be, we see solutions. I mean, look at what Asimi is saying, that there needs to be a framework, a synergy between all aspects of government or all agencies of government that has to do with, you know, recovering looted funds, like, you know, the different aspects he's mentioned. Let there be a database. Let everybody know this is what we have. And let there be transparency for Nigerians to also be aware. Absolutely. That way we can all hold ourselves accountable. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think one of the segments that was made by Sislank is, you know, that the government should... Um, ask questions or at least provide information, you know, as to what has been done with the funds that have been received since uh, former President Olusegun Obasanjo's time. Uh, billions of dollars have been received, have uh, been sent back to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, in what ways have they been used? Were they re-looted? Um, are they currently still in circulation? Um, uh, you know, what did we do with those funds? As much as we we'll give kudos to the current administration for the amount of money that has been received from the Abacha loot, including uh, James Ibori, uh, 4.2 million pounds, um, there definitely needs to be some level of accountability and transparency as to where these funds, you know, are sent to, what they are used for, um, um, you know, instead of just, you know, newspaper headlines that, you know, and that's where it ends. Um, we need to do better. The process of crime, of crime act that the president, you know, of course, as a senator, to, needs to actually be uh, put into work. Um, um, Samuel Asimi, welcome back. Thank you very much. Thank All you right. very much. Um, um, I, just, just to just note that um, we, we don't yet have a, a process of crime act or a process of crime management act. What we have is a mutual legal assistance act, uh, which was signed by the president, which you're referring to. So what that does is that um, helps us to cooperate with other jurisdictions to get these assets repatriated. But for uh, a legal framework to manage these assets, which is the process of crime act bill. Yeah, it was so, still so a bill, what do you, what do you think is, is to, holding the president and, um, from the Pokma? Yeah, sorry, just to because still on the process of crime act. My apologies, I actually made a mistake saying that it had been signed. But what do you think is you know holding the president from signing that um, um, act? Uh, yes, in the past we had it. Uh, civil society, the media, the uh, national assembly had it, and it was uh, almost to be assented to. But then we have um, uh, uh, still the issue of um, would I say um, uh, vested interest, uh, lack of political will, and also some valid concerns around uh, uh, duplication of um, mandates of different agencies. Now, the, the truth is, we have to face this challenge, whether we like it or not. Either we are creating a new agency or we have, if it's an existing agency or a body or the Ministry of Justice which coordinates this, we need to have a proper legal framework and act backed by parliament that would say, if an asset is seized, X, Y, Z happens. If this happens, this is the step to follow. So we don't say we are using Ibori loot to do this. 
Then tomorrow we get Abacha loot, we say you're using it to give the poorest of the poor. The next tomorrow we get Tonda loot, we say we are using it to do this. All this breeds confusion and you find out that this is being this, this is discretionary okay. and it's left at the discretion of whoever holds uh, the power All whoever right. is Mr. in position Mr. at that Simi, point in time. Um, just lastly before we let you go, you know, the subject matter here is five billion dollars stolen from Nigeria, you know, frozen now in foreign foreign countries. Just very quickly, Mr. Asimi, how can the Nigerian government get these funds unfrozen and return back to the country? Uh, I, I think the government, like I said, they've already started making steps. Uh, uh, credits to them. They've started making some of these recoveries. But then if you, if you look at it still comes back to the process of um, crime uh, legislation mm -hmm. or in legislation to manage this because some of these jurisdictions jurisdiction feel that for whatever reasons, it might be for good reasons, it might also be because they want these funds back in their, uh, to remain in their financial system, but they also give this legitimate um, position that if they send these funds back to Nigeria, these funds will also be related again. So they don't trust uh, uh, the country to handle these funds and they feel like since there's no legal framework in place, they are, they, are, they are not satisfied that these funds would, won't be related back. You would see that it, 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 it's sad, it's a problem because uh, people are giving you conditions to return back your own money for their, your own money, mm. which was taken away by individuals. But then that's where we find ourselves. So moving on, uh, the government should actually show um, uh, um, interest, should show commitment on its own part by ensuring that there's a legal framework. Uh, to point, the Ministry of Justice uh, launched um, a portal uh, say it's an asset, uh, AR asset management portal. But the issue is you and I can't assess the portal. It was just left for um, uh, government agencies and uh, other anti graft agencies, and that's the challenge. Okay. We can't have a registry, or we can't say we have a registry that citizens can't check to know if yes. it's working or we what's happening, if these funds are there. Asimi. So this is the challenge. Yes. We, we know right. the challenges, the solutions seem glaring as well. What's left is the political will, like we all say, and taking action. Thanks again, Mr. Asimi, uh, for sharing your thoughts on this very important issue with us on a breakfast. Have a great day. All right. Next all right, up, well. let's talk national unity. We're having calls for that. People are saying that the president address us, convene a national conference to talk about national unity. And that's up after the break.